Magnetism and electromagnetism. A permanent magnet is a metal in which the molecules are permanently aligned in such a way that they produce a magnetic field which can exert a force on particles in other objects and also electrons. We give the two ends of a magnet the names North and South Pole, short for North Facing and South Facing Poles, because that's the way they would point to line up with the Earth's magnetic field. So if we made it float, you can use iron filings or mini compasses placed around a magnet to visualize its magnetic field. Magnetic field lines are always complete loops, even though we don't draw them inside the magnet, and they never touch. These ones going out the ends here will eventually loop back around if we carried on drawing them. The direction of magnetic field lines is always from North Pole to South Pole. An induced magnet is a material, usually a metal, whose particles align temporarily when placed in a magnetic field, so it makes its own magnetic field, hence why an iron nail can be attracted to both the north or south pole of a permanent magnet. We say iron is magnetic, but it is not a magnet. Cobalt and nickel are also magnetic. Copper and aluminium, for example, are not. Bring two permanent magnets together and they will attract if opposite poles are facing, and they will repel if like poles are facing. A current flowing through a wire will produce its own magnetic field. We draw the field lines as concentric circles around it, using our right hand to help us remember which way the field goes. We use the letter B as a shorthand for a magnetic field, by the way, as well as in the equation coming up. The motor effect is when such a wire is in another magnetic field and it will experience a force. The equation is F bill, where F is force, I is current in amps, L is length of the wire in the magnetic field, and B is the magnetic flux density, essentially the magnetic field strength. This is measured in Tesla. Note that this equation only works as it is if the current and magnetic field lines are perpendicular to each other, but maybe it is worth remembering that if the wire is parallel to the field lines, it will experience no force. To find out the direction of the force, however, on the wire, we use Fleming's left-hand rule. Your thumb is force, first finger is field, middle finger is current. Make a janky gun with them where they're all perpendicular and bam, freeze FBI. Just twist your wrist to line up your fingers with the current and the field, always north pole to south pole, and the way that your thumb is pointing is the direction of the force on the wire, in this case, upwards. To measure the size of the force in reality, we can put the magnet on a balance. Due to Newton's third law, the magnet will also be pushed down with the same force. Calculate the force from the fake mass measured, use an amateur to get the current and a ruler to measure the length of the wire and boom, you can calculate the magnetic flux density between the poles of your magnet. Electric motors of course employ the motor effect by using a coil of wire that experiences opposite forces on both sides, causing it to turn. However, the current must be reversed every half a turn, otherwise it would just stop at the vertical position in this case. So that's why we have what we call a split ring commutator to reverse the current every half a turn. To make a motor turn faster, you can increase the current, use a stronger magnet, or add more turns to the coil so there's a greater length of wire ultimately experiencing the force. A loudspeaker is in essence just a motor that goes back and forth instead of round and round. The varying current due to the signal from the music player, say, will cause the coil to vibrate back and forth, and that's attached to the speaker cone, which then produces sound waves in the air. Double people, you're actually done, but don't forget to leave a like before you leave, yeah? A magnet will cause a current carrying wire to move, but the opposite is also true. A wire that's moved through a magnetic field will result in a current being induced in it. The electrons will move. To be more precise, we should say a potential is induced in it, essentially voltage. This can be called the dynamo or generator effect. A generator itself looks like a motor. You turn the coil and a potential will be induced in the coil. This is basically how power stations work. The steam made from burning fuels or nuclear fission turns the turbine which turns this coil. As you can see, we don't need a split ring commutator. It still works. All that it means is that it's an alternating PD that's produced, or alternating current AC. To increase the output of a dynamo or generator, just turn it faster, or similar to a motor, add more turns to the coil, or use a stronger magnet. I say turn it faster, but it's not easy. You see, the current induced in the coil also produces its own magnetic field, and this opposes the turning that led to it being produced to begin with. So that's why it requires energy to keep it turning. And that makes sense. You can't just start it turning and then it just carry on. Otherwise, that would mean you'd be getting energy for nothing. But in other words, this means that induced currents or potentials don't like being made. 
Some dynamos have a split ring commutator or circuitry such that they produce DC instead of AC. It will be lumpy DC though. Over my lifetime, that name has been used for both, I guess, but AQA say generators produce AC while a dynamo produces DC, so let's go with that. Similar to a loudspeaker being a back and forth motor, a microphone is a back and forth generator. Sound waves move the diaphragm back and forth, which is attached to a coil that moves back and forth around a magnet, and that then induces a potential in the coil. That signal then travels through the wires to the phone recorder or whatever. Transformers are used in the national grid to change the voltage at which the electricity is transmitted through the overhead cables. The current from a power station is so high that too much energy would be lost due to the resistance in the cables if it just went straight into them. Therefore, a step-up transformer increases the voltage before it enters the grid. This then reduces the current, so less energy is lost due to heating. The reason one goes up while the other one goes down is because electrical power is equal to voltage or PD times current, V times I. In an ideal world, the power in and out of a transformer should be the same. That would mean that it's 100% efficient. So V and I are inversely proportional. We can therefore say that V times I for the primary coil is equal to V times I for the secondary coil. This is the basic makeup of a transformer. The primary coil is connected to the power station in this case. The secondary coil is connected to the overhead cables. There are more turns on the secondary coil, which means it's a step-up transformer. The voltage will increase the current will decrease. The cars are wrapped around a soft iron core. Get this into your head right now though. There is, or should be, no electricity or current in the core. Instead, the electricity is wirelessly transmitted from one coil to the other. How is this? Well, it's because the alternating current in the primary coil produces its own magnetic field, and the iron core acts like a guide for it. We use iron, by the way, as it's easily magnetized and demagnetized. It works well as a guide. This magnetic field then induces a voltage and current in the secondary coil. In order for a current to be induced, though, a wire must experience a change in the magnetic field, which is why we must use AC. If we use DC in the primary coil, it would make a magnetic field, but it would be static, which cannot induce a current in the secondary coil. The ratio of turns in the coils is equal to the ratio of the voltages. If the secondary coil has double the turns, it has double the voltage, and therefore half the current. So we can say NP divided by NS equals VP divided by VS. You can also flip the whole thing when it comes to rearranging it to find VS or NS. A step down transformer at the other end of the cables steps the voltage back down to a safer PD of 230 volts, which means it must have fewer turns on the secondary coil. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like if you did and pop any questions or comments below. I'll see you in the next video.